Welcome to Therapist Uncensored, a podcast where therapists freely speak their minds about real life matters. Hey, everybody. So today's episode is going to be a little bit different. We typically focus on the science of understanding ourselves and our relationships and kind of overcoming concerns that we may have about any of that. But today's episode is just sheer inspiration. We get a lot of requests for support from individuals that are looking to launch their own podcasts or they're looking to create businesses online. And so today we are going to focus on the inner workings of the mind of an entrepreneur. Today's guest, Christina Z. Holly, she goes by Z. She's an MIT trained engineer turned entrepreneur, and she dedicates much of her career to both exploring the inner world of the entrepreneur as well as helping them launch to success. Z is best known for curating and hosting the first ever TEDx Talks in 2009, as well as starting two different innovation centers. One of them is at MIT, and the other is at the University of Southern California. What's really cool is she now translates this experience into a nonprofit called Making It in LA, and she hosts a podcast, The Art of Manufacturing, where she has extensive interviews with many individuals who have launched a product into the world. Through her education, research exposure, and experience, she brings to today's episode a unique perspective full of insight and knowledge about the inner workings of the mind and personality of the entrepreneur. So without further ado, please welcome co-host Dr. Ann Kelly uh, interviewing Z. For the listeners out there that might be wanting to harness their own inner entrepreneur, yeah. what would you say? What would you say to them? What is what is the, the inner entrepreneur? What's the world of that to all of your experiences and in interviewing? Yeah, so I think, uh, first of all, it's, it's useful to talk a little bit about what what is a startup? First of all, people talk a lot about startups and, you know, think that they're exciting and, and, and maybe I want to start a company. And first thing to, to know is that the a startup is not just a small enterprise. It's, it's actually Steve Blank once said it's a, it's a temporary organization that's meant to find a bit a repeatable business model. And so it takes a different mindset. There's a, a professor at University of Virginia that has, has done a lot of research into the process of entrepreneurship and the mindset of the entrepreneur and found that there's a different way of thinking when you're an entrepreneur and it's called effectual reasoning. And she has like five, five different aspects, but I'd say like the, the most notable ones are, first of all, you don't, when you're an entrepreneur, when you're just starting out, you don't, have unlimited resources, like an enterprise, it feels like you could have, you know, in some cases, billions of dollars to focus on an initiative or a direction for the company. That said, of course, you're a lot more nimble because you don't have that legacy. But as a result, you have to be looking at what your what are your resources. So it may be your personal experiences, it may be your connections, it may be a particular insight into a market opportunity and the ability to not have that baggage of an existing customer base and you can just jump right on board. Now I'm feeling I'm, I'm a bit inside baseball here because now I'm already assuming that the listener is interested in being an entrepreneur and that's that's actually a question. But I do think that there are certain characteristics of human beings to begin with that make us wired for impact. We want to be you know we are naturally curious and we early on as, as babies, you know, we, we have to take some risks and we have to uh, try things in order to learn to walk or talk. And we're imaginative and creative and, and love to play. And all those things are the same kinds of characteristics that make an entrepreneur tick. Um, we also have certain things that are like traps that uh, cognitive biases, etc., that we have to fight against in order to be successful as well. And so it's important to know the difference. And it's important to, to know when to apply and when to when to follow your gut and when your gut is actually taking you in the wrong direction. That makes a lot of sense. Actually, when you said that, maybe one also, I would think, Z, that it has to do with sort of what is driving you in that direction. And working with different people who are either already successful in the entrepreneur world or kind of fantasizing about it, it seems like the drive often does come from this passion to have an impact. So some excitement about being able to create a change instead, we get excited about the idea of implementing something that will leave an effect. 
And yes. it, that seems to be a common theme with people even that kind of stop to think about it. And so as I hear you talking about it, sort of the love of play and the desire to take a risk and enthusiasm, that's sort of a, a starting point. It is really cool to see a lot of that you think, oh, well, entrepreneurs, they're just in it for the money or, oh, manufacturers, they're just like into just making stuff and then selling that stuff. Well, the a large percentage of the entrepreneurs that I interview on my podcast, they are really driven by higher purpose, surprisingly, even even what may on the surface may seem a bit mundane, you know, they're really driven by this passion for something for making an impact seeing what they make, you know, changing the world. And it could include Eric Elistad, who created this company called Local Roots, they're changing the way the supply chain for produce is, you know, around the, around the world by creating these containers, shipping containers that have farms in them. So each shipping container is the equivalent of five acres of farmland. And so that wow. means you can actually grow. Yeah. So you can actually grow produce in New York City or in Chicago or in middle of the dr- desert in Abu Dhabi or on Mars. Um, in fact, SpaceX is one of their customers right now. They're they're working with them to deliver produce to their employees for lunch. But because their shipping containers only use about half of the energy and and could be completely off the grid with solar and only about two percent of the water because they're recycling the water basically it can go they, they're designing it so that it can be totally off the grid so wow. so that's one example and then you have you know kabira stokes who's kind of created and also chris wilson both of them have this passion for putting folks that are coming out of prison back to work and um, the, the whole process around that and learning about some of the challenges uh, and the opportunities to to pick the right right employees, whether you are, you know, looking at folks coming out of prison or just your own building your own workforce. But it's very much driven by this passion to make an impact. That's such a great impact and just the, the excitement to be able to have the personality that you can have the vision and the belief in yourself. We talk a lot on our podcast just about attachment and the ability to feel like you can have agency and that you can actually affect the world. And so what part of what you're saying with an entrepreneur is they have this belief in themselves, some sense of security that this idea that they have could be done, that they have some efficacy to do it, and that it could have a huge impact. And I think you're right. I think sometimes entrepreneurs are seeing that they're sort of driven by money and just trying to to produce something that could sell. And your window is like often that drive fails out and it's the drive towards the passion and the belief and some higher purpose of larger change that can kind of keep you going, I imagine, through yeah, hard times. Is that your well? Experience? And sometimes you're convincing yourself that you're making an impact in the world too. <laughs> it's the only way you can keep going. But uh, yeah, I mean, it's the belief in that, that and holding on to that. Yeah, it's true. But we did. Uh, so some of my colleagues and I did a a study that was funded by the Kauffman Foundation called "The Anatomy of an Entrepreneur," and we fun- we uh, surveyed. Uh, almost 500 successful high growth entrepreneurs, founders. And we mm-hmm. found that probably the, the, the thing that was the most important, one of the most important driving factors in their success was their experience, sort of industry experience and, and applying that to the new application. And they're also were very much driven, you know, motivated by the idea. This was the only way that this idea could get out. So, yeah, so it's like, I have this idea and where I am now, I can't, my company, I, you know, this is, they're not going to pursue this, but I really believe in this idea. And so I have to pursue this. Yeah. It's, so it's, it's, it's actually part of what yeah. becomes the drive. I mean, is that yeah, exactly if I don't do it, it's not going to happen. And yet this passion that I have, and just the example you just gave of that, the sustainable thing that can go to New York and involve very little water. If, if I don't do it this incredible idea that could have a large impact won't happen. I imagine that kind of energy has got to drive you through the hard parts that are inevitably there. Yes. Well, and also, um, ironically, his his family runs a business, a hundred year old family business in refrigerated trucks that 
in mo- in large part are actually pr- transporting produce. So I, I was teasing. I said, you're trying to disrupt your own hundred year old family business. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> so he worked in that. Yeah. So he worked in that, in that realm and then became a, uh, I don't think it was a venture capitalist. I think he was in uh, private equity. And so was, you know, clearly that's, that's a route to financial success, but he just felt like he wanted to roll up his sleeves and have more of a, an impact on the direction of some where these technologies were going. And he just couldn't, he couldn't help himself. <laughs> he just couldn't, he was just kind of driven. That's awesome. Well, tell us, yeah. tell us our listeners a little bit more about what you found in the anatomy of an entrepreneur. I'm totally curious. Yeah. So one of the things that if I were to ask, you know, what, what do you think is the average age when these founders started their business? What would you imagine? How do you think most people would answer the question? 40 is very old. They think the twenties. What's the, what's the truth? You were right first time. It was it is forty. Interesting. So even for like if you're looking across the board, um, and I most people do say most people answer twenty three, twenty five. But even you know the founders at LinkedIn, Reed Hoffman and his partners, like I think they were thir- mid thirties, right, for their company. Like a lot of companies, even high profile ones. But you you really hear the stories about the the young whippersnapper who's like disrupting the, the world. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. But the truth is that, you know, and we did have that discussion a little bit, you know, the, the real value, the real that that these folks are bringing to their startups are is their experience and maybe a dozen years in industry. And so they have a very unique perspective on something that that, you know, a 23 or three year old is not going to understand the need necessarily for supply chain management or a particular security application, you know, or whatever. I'm just making these up. But these are all great needs that, that you only really see unless you're in in industry. And that's going back to the whole effectual reasoning. So coming to the opportunity with your means, as opposed to when you're a big corporation and you say, okay, what direction are we taking this company? You decide there's a there's a bunch of different directions you can go. You decide on a direction and then you put your resources into pursuing that direction. Whereas if you're an entrepreneur, you have your means and then you have to figure out which directions are even within the realm of possibility. And where is it that you have a competitive advantage and so it's it's worth thinking about that too. If you're a prospective entrepreneur thinking about should I be an entrepreneur? Well, what is it that I have that no one else has? What perspective do I have? What resources do I have? And then looking forward, thinking about the importance of partnerships, the fact that you very often can't do it alone, but thinking about how can, how you can work with other organizations. And that's a perfect example of kind of when I I did the I created the first ever TEDx event, which most people don't know it was in LA, it was TEDx USC, worked with TED, the TED conferences to kind of define what the TEDx model might be, instantiate it in the first one in, in, in at USC. And I actually before we did that, I had talked to a colleague who shall remain nameless. Uh, he had his own conference, actually. And I talked to him about this idea that, you know, we wanted to propose this idea to Ted. He's like, don't work with Ted, you should create your own brand, you're going to dilute your own brand. And the truth is that I didn't listen to him. <laughs> and I'm like, no, let's try to do this. There's no way that we would have created something that would scale. It's happened over 30,000 times around the globe, TEDx now. And I can't take credit for that. I mean, this has happened through the force of TED, the people who are fanatical about, you know, TED.com, TED Talks, like, and that's a whole other conversation about how do you make something like that successful, but, you know, and that we don't have to go into, but but just the idea that, you know, we, we had this small institute within USC and we wanted to do this really cool conference, but we wanted to make a, an impact that was greater than ourselves, and that's really what, in a way, manufacturing is about, too, instead of making one of something, an invention or a thing. And that's what in- innovation is about, right? It's about making something that's greater than yourself. So sometimes you need to partner and give up some of your ego <laughs> in order to have something replicate or something have that bigger impact. And the key is to think, what is it that you're willing to go up? What is really important to you? What piece of your brand or whatever it is, do you want to keep? And then what is it that you can give away or that you can allow to be, you know, lost a little bit 
by partnering with other organizations. And I do that with, you know, many other things that I do as well. It's just like, who are the partners that one plus one equals greater than two? One of the aspects is really needing to be able to hitch your wagon means you got to let go and be very relational in some way and knowing, I mean, that's in any relationship, right? It's like, you're going to have to put Mm -hmm. your ego aside and really make it a mutual win-win on some level so that the bigger purpose can go forward. You you mentioned risk-taking. What do you think about, like, so is a a basic hardline part of being an entrepreneur is I need to be a big risk-taker? Well, there's definitely, that is the perception that entrepreneurs are risk-takers and, um, you know, some of the research has shown that entrepreneurs are calculating risk takers. So they don't just take uncalculated risks, but it's more, you know, other people may look from the outside and go, gosh, I wouldn't do that. Or that looks really risky. But you do it based on a certain belief and certain evidence that you actually have something that somebody else doesn't have and that they don't see, right? So there's this thing called efficient market hypothesis, where in the stock market, the assumption is that the stock price has pretty much all the information that's known to date, publicly known to date, baked into the stock price. I mean, there's obviously slight anomalies, and that's that's what causes it to move around. But that's not the case in entrepreneurship. So you may not know, other people may not see what you see. And that's why it's worth taking a risk and saying, we're going to go down this path. And who knows? I mean, a small percentage of companies startup companies actually succeed in the long run. But the ones that do, there's a big payoff a lot of times. And so that's where you have to take that kind of balance it out. But the truth is that we all have this risk, humans have this risk aversion, you know, Amos Tversky and uh, Daniel Kahneman came up with this kind of loss aversion kind of framework. And we all if we're given the choice, for example, of either I'll give you $50 right now, Or I'll give you the chance, a 50-50 chance of winning $100. Almost everyone will pick just the $50. And in fact, you could keep raising that amount, the chance to win, you know, $100, $150, $200. In many people, it's like a two to one. Like you actually have to say, I'll give you a 50-50 chance of winning $200 before you'll actually take that because you're, you're afraid to lose what you have. There's a lot of different psychology behind that that, you know, you probably know better than I do as a psychologist. But so I think that those those are the kind of things that, that prevent most people from actually launching, like going all in into a business and also preventing corporations to go into new business areas. And they wait until startups will often, you know, start their business and prove it out or not. And then they'll maybe acquire the company for way more money than they could have acquired the company years earlier, because they wanted they wanted to reduce the downside risk to doing that. In the area that they have the expertise, they see the opportunity more clearly. So I don't think that in general, they're just more risk takers. Although, to be fair, like I actually feel like I do take more physical risk than most people. I love doing like adrenaline sports and like rock climbing has become this passion and been skydiver and, you know, all that kind of stuff. But that said, again, it's like a calculated, it's a calculated risk. I think that it's really more a matter of seeing that calculus and go, oh, well, that actually makes more sense. And so now I'm going to take, so it's not unreasonable risk, right? But they, they see that calculus more clearly and that they're passionate enough about it that they're like, you know, I'm willing to go down that path. Would another word for that be an educated risk? Like it's, it's not just, you're saying they're not just, I'm in for the risk and we're going to go all in and who knows what's going to land. It's like, it may look like that from the outside. And I think that's what you're saying about why it gets to be a myth that they're just risk takers. What you're saying is actually they're kind of making very educated and calculated and hard experience learned risks yeah. before they're kind of well, they putting themselves out. They know they could that, lose. Yeah, I mean, they see something that we don't, right, in that particular case. Right. Um, that said, I also feel like it is, um, I do laugh, I feel like there's a bunch of self-delusion that happens where y- you would not take that jump unless you saw a, pa- a possible path. The truth is that's probably not the path that you're going to take. There's going to be lots of twists and turns, but you just know that there is a way. You just see it and you just go. And usually if entrepreneurs 
knew how long it was going to take and how hard it was going to be, like really felt it when they took, the, they, they wouldn't do it. I mean, I know that, I mean, I'm, I'm living through it again now, starting a nonprofit. And it's been, actually, I don't even want to admit, like it's been years now since I've really been kind of mulling this over, starting to take, it's like incremental risks. You're like, okay, I've already invested this much. And like, I really, I still see it. it's right there. I can, I can do it. I'm just going to take the next step, the next step. And so you look back, you go, oh my God, it's been, you know, X number of years since I started this. If I had known it was going to take <laughs> this long to get this far, I don't know if I would have done this, <laughs> to be honest. Thanks. But but no, but then at the same time, you're like, oh, if I knew that I'm successful, at least at this far, then yeah, maybe I would take that, right? So it's, you just, uh, it's hard. I think, I don't have kids, but I feel like it's the same kind of a mentality that, that has women having their second child. Because you got to like uh, not <laughs> remember how hard it was the first time, right? <laughs> that was so funny that you said that because I almost had to interject. It's so much like parenting is if you had, or even childbirth, if you had any idea if somebody could tell you how hard it would. And you still wouldn't go back, but it's like, oh my gosh, you have no idea. You're just taking it one developmental step at a time. Yep. But then you do yeah. it again. I mean, that's the th that's the curse of the yes. serial entrepreneur. Like you just can't you, you start getting a taste for it. And I think that the more that you you go through that roller coaster and I just love there's this graph that Paul Graham of Y Combinator. It's a uh, it's a incubator. He has this graph. It's called the uh, oh, was it the trough of sorrow or something where it's an X, Y, you know, and it, and, and your happiness over time. And you get mm -hmm. this inspiration of this idea and you, you just are so enthusiastic. You're like, yes, this is great. And then reality sets in, you know, crashes. <laughs> it's <laughs> like relationship sorrow. <laughs> Yes, yes. Well, yes. <laughs> I don't know if I want to say that. I think my husband might listen to this, so I don't want to. <laughs> no, but it's you know, there's this process, you know, where you, you come to the realization, like, oh my god, my original idea did not work. But then, if you right. really are a true entrepreneur, then you you then say, oh, wait a minute, maybe there's another way of doing this. And in fact, our our very first startup, we had invented this new way of shopping from home we were way too ahead of our times let me time let me tell you this was in 1990 <laughs> before the web oh wow <laughs> and yes so we had this technology for for doing shopping from home using barcodes and touch tones and it turns out and we actually were filing a patent we we went through the effort of actually like putting together the patent ourselves and then we did the patent search we realized oh my god somebody else had the exact same idea there's a patent out there and I have to give credit to one of my partners who, after we went through this kind of low point, <laughs> very big low point, like, okay, we're right, ready to give up. He's like, wait a minute, maybe there's a better way to do it. And it turns out that the fact that that patent was out there forced us to think differently about how you can accomplish the solution. And we actually came up with a better solution. And it was really mm -hmm. um, a really good example, not just of that roller coaster and the and the pivoting, but also the importance of the team or the the collaborators, because when you're doing it alone, it's really hard. And it is a roller coaster. But a lot of times your roller coaster may be out of sync with your other partners roller coasters. So that's why there have been studies that show that the up to five, but the more founders you have in a startup, the more successful, more likely you are to be successful. After oh, five, I think there's too many cooks in the kitchen. But <laughs> uh -huh. yeah, well, and also kind of what I hear in that is that the ability, again, we're going back to the ability to, if you're holding on to something too tight, whether it's a business or a tradition, and you're holding it on too close to your chest, that it kind of withers, it loses its vitality. And so to opening it up and like bringing the people who actually care and investing and allowing the investment to be what keeps people part of the company and innovative, you have the ability to really expand instead of some, we're going to hold on to this one model and we can't, you know, we're going to hold tight and it's mine, 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 you know, and rather than let's, yeah, let's and keep it growing. Ted took a big chance in opening up their model to yeah. the whole TEDx, the TEDx model and a lot of their biggest fans and their kind of inner circle, because, you know, every year at the TED conference, there's about, 1500 maybe now 2000 or so attendees you know they're all like oh no well you know this is the the special ted you don't want to dilute the brand and and there is a risk so you know i will 
acknowledge that. But I, I think that, and I think that they took they took a risk. But I think that in the process, there's not a place that I've gone around the world where people haven't heard of TED now. And right. that wouldn't have been the case, right? They were also under fire when they put the talks online at TED.com, which seems so backwards now to think that that's a bad idea. I mean, there's no comparison between watching a TED Talk and being at TED. Being at TED is a whole right. experience in and of itself. And you connect with the people and you get to, you know, hobnob with, you know, folks that, that are invited and all this stuff. I mean, it's a totally different experience. And But how do people know about TED? Well, it's because they see it on TED.com and, and the, the ideas get spread. So it's just, it's, it seems so obvious in retrospect, but I think that as humans, our first instinct is to have that attachment and that feeling of ownership. And I think that figuring out how to let go is it's hard. But it's sometimes the key to success. Yeah. And and what I would say from a psychologist perspective, is sort of not living in fear, right? Like if the main drive for us is fear of loss, fear of we're going to hold on to our brand so tightly that we're going to become myopic with it. You know, and what I hear, like, I guess, with the example of Ted, I mean, what's the mission? The mission was to get this really innovative thinking out to the world. And if they hold on to their mm-hmm. brand higher than their mission, then they would lose something. Instead, it's yep. like if only the exclusive that could afford to go and sit in those audiences, as wonderful it would be for all of us to be able to do that, that's a very limited set. And instead, like you said, across the world, and I can tell you in my therapy office, one of our uh, guests we uh, just finished having on the show one of my connections to her is I tell my clients, you need to go listen to her TED talk. You know, like I refer to TED talks Mm -hmm. quite frequently in my therapy office because it's a way of getting ideas down to the people who really need it. And so what Mm -hmm. I hear you saying is that part of innovation and, and the creativity of being an entrepreneur is just having a passion of making a difference and letting that be a drive, you know, and, and that you can have that drive now that I'm thinking about it from, coming from the field of therapy and social work, you know, when wanting to make a difference, it used to be sort of connected to only helping one-on-one and, you know, kind of really not grabbing the business experience. It was almost like the division of, are you going to go into business? Are you going to go into the helping profession? You know, there was almost this division between business and a helping profession. And Mm -hmm. what we're talking about with entrepreneurs is it's a huge helping profession. It's like people that are really driven to make a difference on a really global scale and inspire to take the hard knocks to make it happen. And yeah. And and people might look at it and say, Oh, but that's at the expense of success. So, Oh, well you're giving stuff away. That's all fine and good for you. Idealist hippie person, you know, (laughs) whatever. But the truth is that Ted, it is a nonprofit, but it is hugely financially successful And it's in no large part due to the fact that they were driven by that mission and of spreading more broadly. Exactly. And so I think that it's that mission that enabled them to kind of get past the immediate human knee-jerk reaction and and sort of impulse to try to own too much. Mm -hmm. You know, that said, Mm -hmm. they're fanatical about their brand. And I think that there's sometimes some opportunities that they might have lost as a result of it. And and there's also pros and cons, but they they definitely, they don't do it. It's not, they're not completely idealistic. That's for sure. I mean, they definitely have Mm -hmm. um, their business model and it's incredibly, been incredibly successful. Let me take it a different direction for just a second. And what we're talking about is the personality, the perseverance, the kind of aspects of entrepreneurs that make an incredibly successful outcome, right? The ability to let go, the ability to be devoted, the ability to do the hard work. And I guess another one that you mentioned is kind of the ability to when you have hard knocks come in front of you, not give up, to persevere, to like not just live in fear and go, okay, this is mm-hmm. this is a knock off of us. Somebody else has this patent. But instead of taking that as kind of flatlining it, it, you know, entrepreneurs have a kind of noted to have a really good sense of locus of control. It's like, what can we do different? Yes. So there's all these wonderful aspects of them. What do you think about, that's how they perform in business. How do you think that same personality, or do you have any thoughts about it, uh, how that plays out in relationships 
because it takes a lot of commitment, a lot of drive, a lot of passion. It does. So you've got a very devoted, excited, passionate individual. So I can imagine it's very exciting in a relationship. But I guess just like any profession, it can also probably have a kind of a kick or something difficult maybe. Do you see that in terms of that? How, how do you harness all that energy and include a relationship and include family? Do you see that as a struggle out there? I think it can be definitely. And I, I have interviewed some amazing entrepreneurs and folks that have just been through so much. You know, an example is Carl Kanai, who he was the original creator of kind of urban streetwear back in the late 80s. And he got into a bad business deal where this business, unbeknownst to him, like it basically owned the rights to his name. And as a result, the, the his business partners like tried to steal it away from him. And it took him mm. about 10 years and $8 million to buy back the rights to his own name with the like crazy, I, I can't even it takes too long to describe it, but he talks the, about the whole story and it's just incredible. You know, or Greg Steltonpole, who he was the founder of Udwala, the juice company. And now he's the CEO of Califia Farms, the known more for kind of their al- almond milks, et cetera. But he's incredibly mm-hmm, mm-hmm. driven by the mission of helping people get off a, a cow based diet and to promote vegetarianism and but not even promote vegetarianism but like get people off cows and his first company Adwala be in large part because of the a recall that they had and that they lost like 80 percent of their market capitalization of the company and they almost went out of business and so in the end they had to get an infusion of cash and sell out to coca-cola like imagine this is a guy who's all about Uh. planet first people like very mission driven and uh, is he the one he that sort up, of started with orange juice in the back of his VW? Yes. Okay. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So he and his band, yeah. like, you know, that's how they like survived was like juicing, you know, the back of the VW van, like in uh, Half Moon Bay, like, you know, between gigs, you know, they'd be up early the next morning and making juice and, and they turned it into this huge <laughs> beverage it. empire. Yeah. And like, I think uh, yeah. they sold it for I think it was $600 million. So a lot of people uh-huh. congratulate him for that, you know, but I think that deep down inside, he feels like he failed. Um, so, um, which is kind of crazy, uh, right? But account because so clearly he's not money driven above all. And now Califia Farms is his next, next kind of attempt, his second attempt at doing this. And I bring this up because at the time that he was launching the company, the first year or two, he literally was going through, he needed a liver transplant because he had mm. a, some sort of a disease. And his wife was absolutely critical for saving his life basically to say like look you got to stop focusing on this business just long enough to you know get through this liver transplant i mean it's crazy there's another Mm -hmm. entrepreneur i was just chatting with uh, her the other day she found out that she had cancer and she literally had surgery and came back the next day to work this was not Mm -hmm. laparoscopic like this was full-on surgery because she didn't want her employees to know and to lose faith and fear that the company was going to go under because she was afraid that they were going to, I mean, crazy stuff like this. And so it's not healthy sometimes, the fanaticism Mm -hmm. that entrepreneurs Mm -hmm. can bring. And so these examples are just, you know, if you're considering dating an entrepreneur, this is what you're in for, (laughs) potentially. (laughs) You know, I mean, a true entrepreneur that's, it's really, you know, I think that there's a difference between someone who just wants to work for themselves Versus someone who's really right. driven to achievement and success at all costs. Mm-hmm. You know, and they're, they're both valid. I'm not saying, but I think here we're talking more about the really big vision, the big, something bigger than yourself. It's not just more flexibility in your work schedule. I mean, that's the the true inner entrepreneur that we we need to harness, but also har- when I say harness, I mean, use to your advantage and not let it run wild. <laughs> exactly. Or to recognize it's there. And I think part of probably yeah. what's difficult about it is like, you could see the one going back to work or are not doing the liver, you know, kind of putting that off. It's really easy for them to put themselves aside. But I think it's, it's easy to say, well, they're being workaholics, but I don't know if it's the same thing because 
what you're saying is that their work, and in my experience of working, their work is their passion. Like in, in many ways, they don't even see themselves working because they, they kind of love their business or their passion, almost like their children. And so there's this mm-hmm. devotion and to it. And so that or devotion to their employees. And of course, one point that you're pointing out is like, I, I got to show up the next day. I do find that sometimes entrepreneurs have a hard time, like feeling their own weakness in things, feeling like they have to be above it all to people right? Like because they, people count on them so much, right? So it's like, yeah, yeah. I, I, and I can there's see, this incredible, you know. yeah. I mean, there's an incredible sense of obligation and duty and responsibility. I was talking to Alan Lee. He was, he created, I don't know if you've heard of Exploding Kittens, which is the, it was the biggest Kickstarter game in, in history. It was uh-huh. uh, something like a quarter of a million backers for this game. And they created this business that was, um, that were employing within something like eight months, like 800 employees, which is crazy, not not directly, but through their contract manufacturing relationships and all that. And he felt this incredible responsibility, whereas he, he's normally he's a game designer, right? So he loves to experiment and try new things and, and play around. And that's a really big part of his the way he creates these incredible games. And now that he was the CEO of this company, he said, wow, you know, now I need to be a bit more deliberate in how much time I can play versus how much I'm like, I need to make sure that this company is successful because people's livelihoods are depending on me. So there is mm-hmm. an incredible sense of responsibility that comes with it. I imagine people, when they're thinking about going the entrepreneurial route, like you said, that that's not, if you knew exactly what was going to come with it, you might get scared away. And maybe that's also part of the purpose of this podcast and your willingness to come on could help people like if you're thinking about doing what is what's more the reality of it what does it really take because success is not just okay now I've got that whatever in the bank it's like it comes with a lot of obligation it comes with a lot of responsibility yeah it's not right for everyone and I think that that's a good thing right because what if every single person was an entrepreneur then who would work for these companies that we come up with (laughs) (laughs) Well, one of the things, though, that you're what I'm getting out of this, Z, is that there's this way that one of the things that can separate an entrepreneur wannabe and one that is likely to be successful, let's see if I got this right, is that somebody is sort of a little bit more driven by the mission and driven by what they really, with their experience, uniquely think they can give the world rather than what's the idea I can do that's going to create a lot of wealth. Like, like there's a lot to push through that if it, the instinct is wealth alone, that it may be a lot more difficult to be able to take the risk and do the perseverance of all the ups and downs. I think that's generally the case. Although I also have to, I mean, I definitely fall into that camp where I am not driven by money first, but then, then again, you know, well, it's I think not an exclusion talk, of money. No, it's yeah. not an exclusion. But I, you talk no. to some venture capitalists, and they'll say, "I don't, I don't want to back an entrepreneur that's not driven by money." You know, because ultimately they see their exit and their success depends on that return over a certain amount of time. So, sure. and there are people that are really driven by money, but that alone, it's, it's it is really hard for most people for that to be enough of a driving factor, like you're saying. So I yeah. think that I, I do believe that the and what I've seen as those entrepreneurs that are really that have been successful is there's something else behind what they're doing that makes them really passionate about it. What else? Is there anything that we've missed so far in kind of <laughs> helping people har- harness their inner entrepreneur? Do you have any other thoughts? Oh, there's maybe we so much. I mean, I mean, there's so much, really? but uh, I think that. You know, we have been talking a bit about about the whole risk taking, and I and I thought that I might mention too that there's a meme that's going around. It's a little bit of a cliche these days. You know, it sounds counterintuitive, the whole embrace failure, but I think that we have failure wrong. I think that people talk about you know learning from failure, and I think there's definitely truth to the fact that you need to iterate. So. Your first solution, your first idea will never be the last one. If you tight, if you hang on too tightly to the first idea, 
then, you know, you're kind of like the person who's you go into a, a sales situation, and you're just trying to talk, 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 just try to convince the other person and you're not listening, right? So it's really about it's about listening and, and, and getting that information. But that's not failure, right? There was this great video that was posted by SpaceX recently. I don't know if you saw it, but it was about like how not to launch an orbital rocket. It's just one after another of the failures of SpaceX and how they've they learned through the process. And so you look at that, go, okay, well, SpaceX, they got it. They're like, they're embracing failure, learning from failure. But then one time I heard Alon once speak where he said, you know, actually, I'd rather learn from success. <laughs> and so <laughs> if I, mean, I had that's an so option. true, like Yeah. yeah. And so the truth is that we really shouldn't be, it's all a matter of how you define failure, right? I think there's one benefit from the failure, and it's not the failure, it's the bouncing back. It's the resi- It's huh. the confidence that you get from having survived a failure. And because you survived, it wasn't a failure, right? And it actually, it makes you stronger. So I think that, that it's, the, it's the getting up. It's not the falling down, it's the getting up that's really important. And so that's what I would definitely... I would urge the audience to push the comfort zone, you know, like try to push yourself. So maybe it's not like we're jumping out and maybe harnessing your inner entrepreneur may not be starting a business, but it's Mm -hmm. actually just every day thinking about little ways that you can push your comfort zone, try something new, maybe even just take that, you know, look for a new job even as, you know, is, is part of that. And then, and really relish the moments when you're able to take that, struggle that you had or the something you know and where you you picked yourself back up again and pat yourself on the back for that because the more you do that the more you feel invincible and that you're actually going to be much more willing to do what it takes to to be successful and make an impact in the world yeah i like that i like the focus on resilience like the idea of yeah. dealing with failure but think that the focus on resilience and getting back up kind of your story of okay the patent's out there what are we going to do from that place and how do we pick ourselves up and know that that's going to happen? That That's really Absolutely. insightful. It strikes me that if a listener's out there, there's different ways. You know, we talked about the age of an entrepreneur, you know, the, the common mm-hmm. belief that it's 20 and yet you're saying actually that some of the most deeply successful ones are in their forties because they have experience. Do you mm-hmm. see sort of a difference in, in your all of your interviews and your experience of working with entrepreneurs and being an entrepreneur, one that is somebody that is more of a a serial entrepreneur, we get up, we try again, we get up, we try again, versus that person out there that may be in their job and having been in their job for quite a while, but just sitting on this idea and scared to death, but then kind of take it and do it you know, and really make it happen? Do you see a difference in those types of personalities? Somebody that just sort of is an entrepreneur by nature versus, you know, I really, I haven't been an entrepreneur, but I have this idea. Do I have what it takes to take it forward? Are they different types of personalities, do you think? <laughs> well, the, uh, there is always the first time, right? <laughs> but, uh, Isn't that true, I think, right? You know, you did you did mention something that I think a couple things. So one thing is you mentioned locus of control and I definitely think I don't uh-huh. know if you've talked about that on the podcast uh, a lot before but but there is this internal locus of control where somebody is confident that they have control over the outcome of their lives and that they don't wait for permission. But they see an opportunity and they say, "You know what? I'm going to try that." And it's incredibly important. And I think that there's definitely very different, I've seen very different personalities and, and all the folks that I have worked with that have been entrepreneurs. Um, now, actually, I shouldn't say all the ones, the ones that, uh, that are kind of naturally entrepreneurial um, have that extra, mm-hmm. that internal locus of control. Um, that said, when I was running the innovation center at MIT, one of the things that we were really doing was trying to help faculty start businesses. We um, helped start both at MIT and at USC dozens of venture backed businesses that came out of faculty research. And a lot of times these faculty were, this was not part of their personality or not part of kind of their, their quote unquote upbringing or what was deemed acceptable for, for academics, because academics are not supposed to 
be necessarily financially rewarded. It's more kind of reputation, a reputational economy. And those that were interested in it, they didn't really know how to get started. And so I think that mm-hmm. sometimes they did need to see other folks around them, you know, have the, the to kind of change the culture. So like, oh, you know what, maybe this is something I can do too. But that doesn't mean that they don't have an internal locus of control. It's just that that internal locus of control has never been shown on that kind of part of them yet until they're kind of given the permission. So so I, I think that, you know, kind of the opportunity to do it, like it, it kind of given an opportunity yeah. to say I have. Yeah. Yeah. And then I would say another thing that's and there have been some studies done. Richard Wiseman in the UK has done some really interesting studies around luck and about the fact that you can actually cultivate your own luck. And it sounds weird. It's like, how, how could somebody be lucky? And how can you actually cultivate that? But people who are naturally more open to new experience, and mm-hmm. also more extroverted. So those those big five personality traits, the two that are actually that have a real impact are actually a little bit less neuroticism as well, but more like a lot of openness to experience and also extroversion they tend to be much more lucky and have much more success. And the reason this was a perfect example, uh, you may be familiar with a study, but they asked people to respond to an ad. Are mm-hmm. you lucky? Are you unlucky? Come on in for the study. They asked the folks self described, are you lucky? Are you unlucky? And then they said, okay, go through this newspaper and count the number of advertisements in the newspaper. And at the end, they both had kind of the equal amount of like accuracy in the number of same number got the right answer. But the difference between the two groups, are you familiar with this? Do you know like what yeah. the difference was? No, no, keep going. Well, I, I, I can speculate based on other research, but I'm totally intrigued. Keep going. The people who are self-described as lucky got the answer very quickly. And uh-huh. the folks that were unlucky got it it d- took them much longer. And the reason is because on page two, there was an there was an ad that actually said, stop counting, there were 43 ads in this paper. <laughs> and so the people who were <laughs> lucky were not just focused on counting the ads, but they're much more open to other experiences, were much more open to new information and new input. And, and then they did another study, a follow on study with the same folks that just showed that and without, I won't go into it, but just look up, you know, the audience should look up Richard Wiseman or maybe we can s- include a link. But it's pretty cool that definitely you can create your own luck if you just are more open and more outgoing and more curious. And so I think that entrepreneurs definitely fit into that category. That's just a really beautiful example. I love that. I would, I would, <laughs> we will include some of those links into that. And to, for the listeners who are more psychology brained oriented in that, you know, that the locus of control, you, you kind of have actually two kinds of locus of control, internal versus external. Mm-hmm. And what you're describing is the belief of an internal locus of control, meaning that if I'm open and I can take in the world, I can really affect it. And I have a lot mm-hmm. of agency in affecting it where the external locus of control kind of believes that the world controls them. And that would be more of an unlucky focus is if it, if uh, that patent came up, damn, I'm unlucky rather than, okay, what am I going to do about this? You know, so the openness, you feel like you're a victim. Like if you're, you're much more likely to be a victim or unlucky if you have that external locus of control. You know, and it's interesting because if you go back to that Sarah Sarasvati study on effectual reasoning, one uh-huh. of the five, which I didn't mention, one of the five sort of ways that the entrepreneur thinks is this worldview of the uh-huh. fact that you kind of create the future rather than predict the future. So corporate leaders tend to f- spend a lot of time predicting the future and then trying to adapt to that future, which is appropriate, actually. I mean, but not all of them. I mean, look at Apple, right? Steve Jobs said, mm-hmm. all right, this is going to be the future. The future is going to be that there's going to be 10,000 songs in your pocket, the iPod, you know, or the the phone, which is basically your control center for the world, you know, so they created that or Uber, you know, they envisioned this different future. But at the time, they were startup, they, like they were very much more startup focused. And the especially Uber, they were a startup, right when they envisioned this, but it's unusual when a larger company will try to really shift the paradigm. Whereas entrepreneurs come in and they the only way they're going to succeed 
is if they take that crazy risk, the chances are very low of success. So and the only way they're going to succeed is if they take a big risk and if they do something kind of, you know, unless they're going to be stay small, right? But we're talking about companies that really want to do something big. So it's a different worldview. It's I guess it's an internal locus of control of the organization in a way, right? It's thinking like Mm -hmm. our company can actually change the world. And how else are you going to convince people to come on board and give up a a big salary at a larger company and job security and a pension to join this crazy startup that has, you know, very low chance, honestly, of succeeding is by having that sort of grander vision of really changing the world. Oh, yeah, that's a that's a wow, that's really insightful. And I love the way you're pointing out sort of the difference of somebody that's up there in an executive and already existing large company, kind of predicting and acting versus the creator, the one that how are Mm -hmm. we going to create the future and that internal feeling of we can make a difference. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's beautiful. Well, Z, thank you. So you have brought such insight to, to me as a psychologist, honestly, having worked with many entrepreneurs in my profession, you really have brought a kind of a new window and a new insight into this exciting aspects of that personality. So I know our listeners are going to love it. We hope you've enjoyed this window into the life and mind of an entrepreneur. And hopefully it will be inspiring for that idea that you might be sitting on that you might want to actualize. And hopefully it'll help you uh, take action on that. You know, without risk, there's no reward. So we encourage you to go for it and take one small action towards that little idea that you have in there or big idea that you have in there. You can find Z, you can find more about her at her podcast, The Art of Manufacturing, and you'll find that at artofmfg.com, art at mfg.com. Now, getting back to the specific topic of attachment, we've got a lot coming at you. We're very excited. Right now, we have a few more slots open for the reading group that's going to start at the end of January. It'll be a six-session group where we'll be reading together. It's online, so you can sign up from anywhere. And for the online course... We will be reading the book, Attachment, Disturbances, and Adults, and that book is by Daniel Brown and David Elliott. What's really great is if you happen to be regional, the course leads us up to the live conference, which will be April 7th with David Elliott. So that's super exciting. Lots coming at you. And of course, the intro course is also happening very shortly. Um, That is free. So for all of those reasons, be sure and sign up. You can follow us on Facebook and get on our email list and you will, you know, be informed of all these things. So drop us a line, let us know how we're doing. And so for those of you kind enough, please leave us a review on any of your podcast players. We got a really great one from Sarah who mentioned uh, specifically the the Tina Payne Bryson interviews. And she said she loved, loved, loved them. And she learned so much and felt like the information presented is relatable and applicable to both personal and professional life. So thank you for those five stars. And if you leave one we, and we find it and we see it, we will certainly give you a shout out because we really appreciate it. And it's really meaningful to us. All right. Thanks for listening. We've got a lot more coming. Therapist Uncensored is Ann Kelly and Sue Marriott. This podcast is edited by Jack Anderson.